Good morning. Good morning. We on? We're on. All right. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker to you all, Mr. Mark Charles. Mark is the son of an American woman of Dutch heritage and a Navajo man, and is a national speaker and, writing regard, and writer regarding modern day history. He serves as the Washington DC correspondent and regular columnist for Native News Online, and is currently writing a book called Unsettling Truths. He's writing it with Dr. Sunshan Ra, and they're doing it for InterVarsity Press right now, and it's about the doctrine of discovery, which we will be hearing about later today. Most importantly, Mark is a Christian. He's a founding partner of the National Conference for Native Students, Would Jesus Eat Fry Bread? He consults with the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship, and he served as a pastor at the Christian Indian Center in Denver, Colorado. Now, I heard Mark speak last May at a conference, and he spoke yesterday to several of you in my early Christianity class. Um, it's actually, I think, a providential kind of thing that he's with us here today. So one of my good buddies from college uh, that I played soccer with, Mr. Paul Donnell, uh, bumped into him at an airport. Mark had spoken at his church in Washington, D.C. Pa Paul was on the road traveling for business, and so Paul was listening to one of his podcasts while Paul was at the airport, and he bumped into Mark there. And he said, I'm listening to you right now. You don't know me. <laughs> but I have a school I'd really like you to come, come share with. And so that kind of got, got the wheels in motion for Mark to come here. Mark's mission is clear. His message is powerful. And his voice is one that Christians in America desperately need to hear. So I'm very grateful he's with us here today. Would you please join me in welcoming Mr. Mark Charles? Thank you. Yat A. Mark Charles, Yenis, yeah? Sin Bekei Dene, Nisle, Do To Higlini Basis Chin. Sin Bekei Dene, Basis Che, Do To Do Chitni Basis Nella. In the Navajo culture, when you introduce yourself, you always give your four clans. We're a matrilineal people, and so our identities come from our mother's mother. My mother's mother happens to be American of Dutch heritage, and so I say, Tsin Dene Nishle. Translated, that means I'm from the wooden shoe people. <laughs> my father's mother, my second clan, is Toa Higlini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsin Dene. And my fourth clan, my father's father, is Totochitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. Before I go any further, I want to just acknowledge that we are standing on the land of the Osage and the Miami and of the Sioux. And these are the people who inhabited these lands. They hunted here. They farmed here. They raised their families here. They buried their dead here. Um, their, their lives were here. These were the people who were removed from these lands so that the state of Illinois could be established. These are the people who were removed from these lands after Columbus got lost at sea. And I like to acknowledge the people whose land I'm on, just because it helps me to remember there's a history that goes beyond what my history books tell me. And it's also a good thing to remind myself that uh, Columbus did not discover America. Um, these lands were already inhabited. And it, it just helps me to walk with greater humility remembering those things. The next half an hour or so, I want to talk to you about one of my favorite topics. And believe it or not, if you've heard me speak before, it's not the doctrine of discovery. It's actually about Jesus. <laughs> I love talking about Jesus. Jesus is probably one of the most subversive, radical teachers this world has ever seen. And it really breaks my heart that most of us don't even know him. I grew up in a Christian school. I went to Sunday school. I knew all of the right answers. I knew what the flannel graph said. I knew what everything had to be. I knew how to get the, get the star by my name and all the right tests. And I got to college and I went to UCLA. And I had been in Christian school for 12 years, and I got to college, and, you know, my senior year of high school, they asked everyone to stand up if they were a Christian. And, of course, everybody stands up, because what are you going to do? You're in a Christian school. <laughs> and I got to UCLA, and I'm like, people don't care. They don't care if I go to chapel. They don't care if I go to Bible study. They don't care if I go to church. They don't care if I do whatever I do in my free time. They don't care. 
And so I began wondering, why am I doing these things? And I began looking very closely at who Jesus is. And realized, as I've not just then, but even through today, that we have turned Jesus into this very weak, partisan, economic sellout. And we use him in these battles with each other. And I, I would love to see Jesus do an interview on MSNBC or Fox News. You know, like I would love to see that. Because whenever people came to him with the partisan questions of the day, hey, Jesus, should we pay taxes? Well, what's on the coin? Uh, Caesar. Give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Huh. You know, they, they drag this woman caught in adultery. The scriptures say they should stone her. They're ready. They're, they got their rocks ready. They're ready to kill her. First, we have to note the man is nowhere to be found. And second... They're asking Jesus, what do we do? And he looks up at them. Well, he first he kneels down and draws in the sand, drawing all the attention onto him and off of this woman. And then he looks up. He says, well, sure. Whoever's without sin, go ahead and cast the first stone. And beginning with the oldest, they all begin walking away. I, the guy is a genius, right? He takes whatever, whatever the big partisan, get on this side or that side, are you with us or against us, where are you? And he's like, I'm not with any of this. I'm on God's side. We are doing something radically different. They were expecting Jesus to be this political Messiah who was going to come and, and, and bring greatness back to the nation of Israel. And John the Baptist, one day he hears that Jesus was, was out healing servants of centurions and raising widows' sons from the dead. And John's like, this is not the political guy we were expecting. He's aiding and abetting the enemy. And he sends his disciples to Jesus and say, hey, are you the one we're waiting for? Or should we look for somebody else? And Jesus doesn't even answer. He turns around. He heals more sick people. He casts out more demons. He gives sight to more of the blind and hearing to more of the deaf. And he turns to John's disciples and says, Go back and tell your teacher what you just saw. And blessed is the man who doesn't stumble on my account. See, when the church drags Jesus into this partisan bickering, we forget who we are. We think first and foremost we're Democrats or Republicans, liberals or conservatives, rich or poor, educated or uneducated. We forget that, first of all, we're followers of Jesus. And Jesus deconstructed all of those systems and put something else radical in place. And that starts, I think, in what we want to talk about today, which is his understanding and his relationship with power and with authority. If you look in the Gospel of Mark... Jesus comes on to the scene in the Gospel of Mark very quickly. He doesn't, they don't do the birth narrative. They don't do all of his early years. They start writing with his baptism, John the Baptist, and then we have his, his, his ministry is starting at the end of the first chapter. And he goes into the synagogue, and that's what's his custom. He began teaching from the scriptures. And people were amazed at Jesus because he taught them, not as the scribes and the teachers of the law, but he taught them with authority. So the scribes and the teachers of the law, when they taught, they had their bibliographies, they had all their, their awards and all of their diplomas behind them. They're like, you know, according to Rabbi so-and-so, who I studied there last year, let me tell you this, it's going to scroll such-and-such, such, which was really hard to find, but I read it in this really obscure library, let me tell you this. And Jesus stands up and says, well, you heard this was said, but let me tell you what we were thinking when we wrote that down. Jesus didn't talk like someone who studied scripture. He talked like someone who wrote it. And that freaked people out. They're like, what, what? If you talk to someone who read a good book and you talk to someone who wrote a good book, two completely different conversations. In that same synagogue, he's confronted by a man with an unclean spirit. And the people are amazed because Jesus spoke to him with authority and the spirit left him. One day he's out in the boat. He's been teaching all day. He's with his disciples. They're going to cross the sea. 
And he lays down. He's with some experienced fisherman. He doesn't have much to worry about. And he lays down in the boat. And while he's sleeping, a squall comes up, a windstorm. And the boat starts taking on water. Now, these are experienced fishermen. And we often misinterpret this passage as if they go to Jesus in fear. Right? They don't go to Jesus in fear. If you're a fisherman and you're on a boat and the boat's taking on water and you know what you're doing and there's this crazy guy over here who's asleep, are you afraid or are you mad? Right? Jesus, I don't care who your daddy is. Grab a bucket. What are you doing? Don't you care if we die? Right? They're upset with him. What are you doing to sleep? He wakes up, looks out. He doesn't grab a bucket. He speaks. Wind, calm down. Waves, be still. And it goes silent. Then it says, the disciple, who is this? Even the wind, they're terrified, right? The wind and the waves obey him. They, they, he's, they've blown their minds. Right? Power is the ability to act. Authority is the right of jurisdiction the permission to act. We live in a world, in a nation, we attend churches that are obsessed with power. There's not a, a, a day, a, a week that goes by without someone from our federal government reminding us that we have the most powerful military in the history of the world. There's not a day that goes by that someone from Wall Street doesn't remind us we've created the most wealthy financial system in the history of the world. Our churches build huge Buildings, lavish sanctuaries. We're obsessed with power. For power to be effective, you have to demonstrate it, right? Why does most of the world listen to the United States of America? Well, because we're the only nation in the world that's ever killed civilians with nuclear bombs. Right? That's why they do it. That's why they listen to us. We've demonstrated we have nuclear weapons, and we're not afraid to use them. So people listen to us. We pay money to a lot of nations all around the country. Why? So they'll listen to us. We demonstrate our power over and over and over again. What happens to the influence of the United States if we lose our nuclear arsenal and we go bankrupt? Who listens to the voice of the United States of America in that situation? Nobody. Why? Well, we have a ton of power, but we have no authority. Right? Authority is the right of jurisdiction, the permission to act. We have the ability to act. We have a lot of power. We have very little authority. You will rarely, if ever, hear our government officials, and even our church officials, talk about authority. Because we don't have much. They will always go back to our power. So Jesus... He wasn't running around demonstrating his power, right? When he's at the wedding at Cana and his mom comes to him and says, hey, they're out of wine. Listen to my son. And he, he tells the servants to put some water in these jugs and to go bring them to the head of the feast. And while they bring it, the water turns to wine. And the people are amazed. Why? Well, because most people serve the best wine first when people are sober, and the bad wine when people are drunk, right? Because they're not going to know the difference. And they're saying, these people are amazing. They serve their best wine last. They're wasting this incredible wine on these bunch of drunk people. Now, why did they not... No one was saying, hey, Jesus turned water into wine. Why? Because what did he tell the disciples and the servants? Don't say anything. Right? He goes up to Jairus' house. Jairus, is, his daughter's just died. He's an important man in the city. Jesus goes up to see what he can do to help. He, he thought she was sick still. He's walking up, and there's all these professional mourners who are wailing and putting on a show in front of his house. And Jesus walks up, and he says, oh, she's not dead. She's asleep. The people laugh at him. You're an idiot. What do you mean she's asleep? We saw her die. He goes into the room, shuts the door, puts everybody out except the mother, the father, and his three disciples. Then he raises her from the dead. 
he feeds her. And then what does he tell them? Shh, don't say anything. So they walk out with the girl five minutes later. What does everybody think? Oh, we must be the idiots. We can't tell the difference between a dead girl and a sleeping one. Jesus isn't about demonstrating his power. He's exercising his authority. He doesn't care who believes him or not, right? When the teachers of the law at the end of the Gospels come and say, Jesus, demonstrate your power so that we might believe in you, he's like, no, I don't play that game. I'm not about demonstrating my power. And so in Mark chapter 6, Jesus calls his disciples to them, and he gives them authority. Cast out demons, heal the sick, and preach the word. And then he says to them, take out your power and leave it here. I'm not going to throw my smartphone, but I'll set it here gently. <laughs> Technology isn't that good. It won't bounce yet. <laughs> Leave your power here. Go out with nothing. And go in groups of two so you're vulnerable. Right? This is like the first episode of Survivor. <laughs> this isn't a mission trip. This is see who comes back. <laughs> you know? I mean... And he sends them out literally to get on their knees every day and pray for their daily bread. And he says, while you're on your knees begging God to feed you, pray for the people around you and then stand up and serve them. Now, if you've ever literally prayed for your daily bread, I don't mean they're serving something you don't like in the cafeteria. I mean, you're literally praying for your daily bread. You have nothing in the cupboard, nothing in your checkbook, and nothing coming in the mail, and your wallet's empty, and you don't know where your next meal is coming from, and you are on your knees begging God, please feed me, and you're feeling like a failure because the church has taught you that if you ever have to ask God for your daily bread, it's because you've sinned. And so you're down on your knees, feeling like a failure, praying for your daily bread, and it's almost impossible to think about serving the needs of those around you because you have slipped into what's called survival mode. You're just trying to stay alive now. This is how Jesus sends out his disciples. So they go out. The first thing we have to know is they come back. So they lived. Something happened. Something worked. But now they've been so busy casting out demons, healing the sick, preaching the word, that they have followers, and there's all these people milling around, and they're so busy they can't even eat. So Jesus says to them, hey, let's go across the lake and get some rest. So they jump into the boat, they go across the lake, but there's a fatal flaw in his plan, which is it's a small lake. <laughs> so the people just run around the lake, and they beat them there, Right? And, and you can almost see the annoyance in the disciples' eyes when they pull up to the shore. Like, oh, crap. <laughs> They're here. And Jesus, of course, he's, he's a good guy. He has compassion on them. They're like sheep without a shepherd. And so he starts teaching them. The disciples wait an appropriate amount of time, maybe like early afternoon. And finally, they're like, Jesus, it's a lonely place. There's nothing to eat here. Send the people away. They need to go get some food. So, oh, yeah, you're right, you're right. They are hungry. You feed them. What? Jesus, this is empty. My Venmo is blank. Like, what, what is it to feed them with? I have nothing. It would take nine months of a man's wage. Is it going to spend fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 buying bread for these people? Jesus said, well, what do you have? Go and see. So they run out, they find this kid, they shake him down. <laughs> they grab his lunch, right? They come back, they got this snack pack. They're like, Jesus, we got five loaves and three fish. This is not even enough for Peter to eat, right? <laughs> and Jesus takes this little lunch, and he doesn't give the prayer that we're all used to giving, which is, God, I have this enormous problem and these little resources, please help me. He looks up to heaven and he thanks God. Thank you for these few loaves and these few fish. And then he begins breaking them apart and passing them out. And there's so much created that everyone has something to eat. 
And just to drive his point home, he makes his disciples go around and pick up the leftovers, and they all fill a basket full of food, just to remind them of his abundance. So now he gives them another command. He says, okay, I want you guys to get in the boat again, cross the lake and go to the other side and prepare the next place for us. I'm going to dismiss the crowds here. So they get into the boat, they start rowing, Jesus goes up into the hill, he dismisses the crowd, he sits down, he looks out, it's evening, the disciples aren't going anywhere because the wind's blowing against them. Now Jesus doesn't do anything. He sits there, he hangs out all night till like four in the morning. Four in the morning he looks out, they still haven't moved, they're still in the middle of the lake. The wind's blowing, they can't row anywhere. So he walks out onto the lake And he's walking past them. And the disciples, who are now frustrated and angry, they've been rowing all night, they're probably pretty delirious, and they look out and they see this guy walking past them on the lake, and they freak out because they think he's a ghost, and they start crying out in fear. And Jesus walks over to them. He's like, guys, calm down. It's just me. And he gets into the boat, and the minute he gets into the boat, the winds die down. The test is over. They failed. It says they looked at him and were astonished because they did not understand about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. This goes back to when Jesus said, you feed them. What did he mean? What did he expect them to do? Well, Mark, the gospel writer, only gives us two clear options of what he expected them to do. The first is to ask questions. Just a few passages later, he raises this issue in the Gospels of insider versus outsider, the secret of the kingdom of God. Jesus stands up, he goes out to teach, there's all these people in front of him, and he gives them five simple farming tips. This is what happens to seeds when you put it on the path, here's what happens when you put it in the weeds, here's what happens when it goes into good soil, this is what happens when the birds eat it. And then he sits down, and people are like, I thought this was a good teacher. Where's the miracles, you know? Like, we came for a show. And eventually they all leave, and only the disciples are left. And they're like, uh, Jesus, what do what you, what you mean by that? Ah, you have the secret of the kingdom. To everyone else I speak in parables, lest they turn and be forgiven. But to you I explain everything. What did the disciples have no one else had? They stayed. They asked questions. The secret of the kingdom is staying and asking questions. So one option is Jesus wanted his disciples to ask questions. The second option is he wanted him to do what he did, which is find the kids, shake them down, take his lunch, thank God for it, pass it out. Now, both of those have problems. The ask questions challenge is that whole teaching is wrapped up in this language of insider versus outsider, and Mark doesn't bring that language into the story, so it's a bit of a literary leap to think he's trying to get us to make the same point when he doesn't use the same language. The second challenge with the other one, with just do what Jesus did, is Jesus hasn't multiplied food before. He didn't give them authority to multiply food, right? Right? Cast out demons, heal the sick, and preach the word. Nothing about multiplying food. And they haven't even seen him multiply food before. So he's asking them a question. He hasn't even shown them the answer to the question yet. Unless there's precedent somewhere in Mark or in the Old Testament where God expects his leaders to do something he hasn't told them they could do. So now let's go back to Exodus chapter 14. Moses has just done the ten plagues. Pharaoh's finally relented. And he's released the people of Israel to go out. God pulls Moses aside and says, okay, here's the plan. Don't go this way, because if you go this way, you're going to hit a war. Go this way. I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. He's going to come after you, but don't worry about it. We're going to take care of everything. So Moses goes this way. As they're trekking along, they hit the Red Sea. They turn around, and sure enough, God's hardened Pharaoh's heart. They see the dust in the background that... His chariots are coming to reclaim his slaves. And the people of Israel lose it. They start crying out. Was it because there were not enough graves in Egypt you brought us out here to die in the wilderness? We told you, Moses, we would rather be slaves in Egypt than corpses here in the desert. They lose all faith that God or Moses can do anything to help them. Now Moses, who's not a very good 
leader yet, right? God called him. He's like, I don't want to go. I can't talk. Send somebody else. Moses starts writing the Psalms. He says to the people, be still. Wait on the Lord. If you cry out to God now, the enemies you see today, they will never bother you again. All you have to do is wait on the Lord. This is one of the most faithful phrases Moses has uttered in his entire ministry up to this point. David is almost re-saying those same things in the Psalms later. What's fascinating is the next verse. Because God doesn't rebuke the people of Israel. He rebukes Moses. What are you crying out to me for? Stand up, pick up your staff, and part the reds. What are you doing on your knees? They're coming. They're going to kill you. You have that staff. You saw what it did in Egypt. Take it out for a test drive. What else does it do? He's literally rebuking Moses for not coming up with the idea of parting the Red Sea himself. That should terrify you. <laughs> so when Jesus said to his disciples, you feed them, he expected them to feed them. When they didn't do it, he did it for them. He gave them another command, cross the sea. He let them row all night. Finally, 4 a.m., he went out on the sea, and Mark says he was not going to help them because it said he meant to pass them by. Jesus is just like doing a show and tell. He's like, guys, this is what you do. You can't row across the sea and get out and walk, or at least calm it. You've seen me do that before. They didn't get it. They were stuck in this paradigm of power, and they could not understand the authority that God was trying to give them. Now, when I first began to realize this, I began to, to understand that, okay, there's, Jesus, you're, you're crazy. <clears throat> See, my whole life, because I've grown up in this paradigm of power, I've learned to treat God and Jesus as my banker. Right? Who of us have not heard a command from God, do this, serve these people, help out over here, and immediately we have a budget, right? Right? Okay, God, that's going to be $15,000. So we pray for it, we write our letter, and then we do what? Well, we wait, right? God has to provide. Now, if you read the scriptures, very seldom does God give money in response to being asked for it. Right? Again, money is a man-made thing. God's a creator. He's not a banker. And the the way creators think and the way bankers think are completely different. And I've realized when I started to, to understand God not as my banker, but as my creator, I'm like, I finally realized what the psalmist was saying when he said, your ways are higher than my ways and your thoughts than my thoughts. I don't even think like you, God. Like, I would expect God to build a bridge. I would expect God to send a motorboat. I would expect God to do something, not part the sea. A creator and a banker think very, very differently. And because, as the church, we've been stuck in this paradigm of power for so long, we have a very difficult time imagining what it means to operate with authority. And that's what Jesus did. And so I began, immediately after seeing this in the scriptures, I began changing the way I pray. Because if you read the scriptures, Jesus and God frequently tell their followers Trust me with money. Test me with money, he says. See if I'm not faithful. So I decided, okay, God, every time I'm tempted to pray for money, because let's be honest, we all pray for money a lot. Every time I'm tempted to pray for money, I'm going to rephrase my prayer as a request for authority. Instead of money and a better job to feed my family and clothe my children, I'm going to ask for the authority to be the father and the husband you've called me to be. Instead of the money to go on this mission trip, I'm going to ask for the authority to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but I, I treat my prayer life like a batting average. I'm never going to bat a thousand. I just want to connect with the ball a bit more. 
And most faithful Christians in our today's world, it's not that they pray effectively, it's that they've just become very adept, adept at explaining why God doesn't answer these prayers. And so I'm just excited when I hit the ball more, when I connect more. And when I started praying for authority instead of power, I noticed my average went up. And that's the challenge I want to give you today. You don't have to go out and part the Red Sea tomorrow. You don't have to go out and change the world tomorrow morning. But go out and see if you can connect with the ball a bit more. Change your paradigm from power to one of authority. And the way that, the way that happens, and this is one of the reasons why the institutional church in America will never see this happen within their doors is because if you want the authority of God, you have to lay down your power. And the institutional church and governments are not willing to do that. So we have to lay down our power. And that is what gives us access to God's authority. Let me pray for us. Jesus, you challenge us to the core of our being. And we are so grateful for that. We're so grateful you didn't get caught up in the partisan bickerings of your day, but you were able to bring every conversation down to the heart of the matter, which is that people do not trust you and we do not know how to love one another. Father, I pray that you will raise up out of these students, prophets and teachers and people who are able to discern the distinction between power and authority and to help decolonize the church so that we can begin to truly be the prophetic witnesses you've called us to be. Thank you for the teachings of Jesus. Thank you for sending your own son into this world to live as an example for us. And thank you for the conversations that will come out of studying his scriptures, studying his stories, and, and, and learning more about his life. Father, bless our time today. Bless the discussions we have the rest of the day. Thank you for the opportunity to be together. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.